tape is being made in uh, <coughs> Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, June the eighth, uh, year two thousand, and uh, this reunion is uh, the fifty-fifth anniversary of the liberation of Stalingrad One part of Germany, where uh, the POW roommates were all uh, incarcerated uh, in the same room uh, in 1943. And in 1944 and 1945, uh, uh, Stalingrad One had grown from zero to about 9,000 men. And uh, the roommates that are here today, uh, the original 25 roommates at least, uh, were all shot down about the same time and all spent around a, a year in uh, the prison camp. That's the reason we were all in the same room, and we weren't necessarily 25 of us in the room at the same time, but we were always at least about 20 in the room. Uh, but uh, Alma Leon, for example, was sent to another compound to uh, be a, a barracks commander, and uh, the Germans were consolidating a lot of people in the rooms and putting in triple bunks and that sort of thing. So people were moved in couple people were moved in from other places. But in total we had uh, 25 roommates. Uh, they all were flying B-17s or in B-17s as pilots, navigators, or bombardiers, or in B-24s with the exception of a P-47 pilot and a P-51 pilot. And uh, after the war, uh, uh, of course we all went our different uh, ways and married, raised children, all a career, and it wasn't until the 80s that we really started to look for one another, and we found one another uh, in the 80s. Three had died, a couple were very ill, uh, but we decided to have a reunion in Dayton, Ohio in, 18, in 1989, during July. And it was a successful reunion. It was at a held at a time when the Aviation Hall of Fame was having its enshrinement ceremonies. <clears throat> there was an airfare there, and of course the uh, Air Force Museum was located in Dayton. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, the PBS station in Dayton did a 30-minute documentary on the reunion, uh, which, uh, of course, each uh, POW roommate was able to obtain uh, for, for his family. At this uh, reunion, uh, most of it is, uh, of course, to visit one another and to uh, uh, talk about our times together when there was a lot of bonding. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to do is hold a uh, remembrance ceremony at the Chapel of Transfiguration, and, uh, which is a 75-year-old log uh, structure uh, in the Grand Teton National Park. And uh, uh, the procedure is handled by a couple of our roommates and a wife of one of the roommates. Jack Murphy usually has a, a bit of scripture to read. Uh, uh, Lawrence Wiesau uh, reads a couple of appropriate poems or parts of poems. And at the end of that, uh, he names off the deceased roommates and, and any wife uh, who has died. And uh, then after each name is called, uh, Rita Wiesau rings a little handbell. And at the end, we hope to uh, have a song, a hymn, uh, sung by Don Demert, who uh, has been singing professionally in churches for many, many years, and used to sing for the group in the prison camp. And uh, we have an organist uh, that's going to be there. The ch chapel's on very small, it's only about 35, 40 seats, benches actually. and. Uh, Don's going to sing, and hopefully uh, all the rest of us uh, who are there will join in and, and uh, sing the hymn along with him. We're going to take a tour of Yellowstone after the after our stay here at the ranch. It's going to be an overnight tour, and we're going to go up through uh, Old Faithful and West Yellowstone up to Mammoth Hot Springs, stay overnight, and the next morning. Uh, Mike Finley, the superintendent of Yellowstone, is going to speak briefly with the group, and uh, 
then we're going to proceed uh, through uh, Tower Junction and on down to uh, Fisherman's Bridge and, and Lake uh, Village, uh, and we're going to have lunch at the Lake Hotel, uh, which uh, was built just slightly before the 1900s. And from there, we'll go back to Jacksonville, Wyoming, and stay overnight. And then the folks will, most of them, will be leaving uh, the next day. You want to stop? How about a little of your milk? It's my understanding that uh, uh, each one of the POW roommates are, who are here would be 12. They're going to be making a video and, uh, similar to this and uh, give a bit of their military experience uh, for the record and, and for the families. In my own case, uh, I graduated from high school in Greenville, Ohio in 1942. I worked that summer uh, and that fall I uh, started at Ohio State University and but a couple of months and uh, enlisted in the Army Air Corps in the cadet program. Uh, I was 18 at the time. Uh, I went through uh, pilot training, uh, graduated, uh, got the wings and commission when I was 19. Uh, I was sent overseas, uh, flying B-17s when I was 20, shot down when I was 20, shot down over Nuremberg, Germany, and then uh, turned 21 in the prison camp after having been in the service three years. Uh, when I came home uh, after the war, uh, discharged and uh, uh, entered uh, Harvard uh, University and received my uh, undergraduate, undergraduate degree and then uh, went to Ohio State University and received my law degree and then returned uh, later on, a few years later, to the Graduate School of Business Administration at Harvard, uh, having been sent there by the company I was working for. I had spent uh, 13 years uh, with the National Case Richard Company, later called NCR, uh, as a, a member of their legal firm. Uh, at that time there were only three lawyers in the firm, and I later became Assistant General Counsel. And then in 1965 I became the Personnel Manager uh, for the company's 104,000 employees around the world, and I stayed in that job for 20 years uh, until I retired in 1985. Since that time, we've uh, lived here in Wyoming and partly in uh, Arizona. I was on my uh, 25th mission as a uh, B-17 pilot. I, I, I was flying co-pilot and uh, we were over Nuremberg, Germany and uh, we were shot down by anti-aircraft. Uh, the plane exploded within a few seconds and uh, we had nine men on the crew and six of the men were killed uh, instantly and uh, the navigator uh, was blown clear of the wreckage and he woke up uh, floating down with his parachute uh, hooked on one side of his harness and he landed in a tree and his right side had been completely paralyzed and he was in the hospital for at least a month before he ended up in the prison camp. Uh, the tail gunner uh, crawled out of the open end of the tail. The tail had been blown off and uh, he estimated uh, that he had uh, been able to get out and get his shoot on at about 15,000 feet. We had been flying at 26,500 feet. Uh, in my own case, um, I uh, had bent over to put my steel flak helmet on. I had my right arm up on the edge of the, of the side window of the, of the plane and when we were hit. And it uh, probably saved my life because uh, if I'd been sitting up, I'd have been hit in the head with the flak that, that shattered my right arm and I had one bone in the, the arm shattered and um, I had the jaw tooth knocked out, uh, half of it knocked out and the face cut up some. And, and, uh, but still, 
who was able to function, and uh, I knew I had to get out of the airplane if I was going to save my life. And I was still alive, so I figured well, I should try to do that. And I reached uh, under my seat uh, and picked up the parachute pack, which uh, was a place where we always, the pilots always stored their parachutes because you couldn't wear them uh, on your chest because you were too close to the steering mechanism of the airplane. So I was able to seize the handle of the pack and uh, when, the, when the pressures were right, I released my seat belt and fell free from the wreckage, which was turning over and over and on fire and smoking and burning. And one body came flying over the top of the cockpit, and uh, I don't know who it was. It could have been the top turret gunner, it could have been the, the other pilot. At any rate, uh, I uh, tried to hook my uh, parachute on the harness, and I couldn't get it to hook. And it's a very simple matter, of course, just snapping it on the, on the rings. Um, but I couldn't get it to work, and I, and I realized I had my flak vest on, and uh, I must have been falling down, face down, and the wind was holding the pack, uh, the, the vest on my chest, because the back had just flown away. I pulled the red cord. And and the uh, back fl floated away, and so then I just turned over gently, and the front went away, floated off, and because uh, at that speed, a uh, man falls about 120 to 130 miles an hour, and each item would would, would fall at a little bit different uh, speed, uh, but nothing drastic, like nothing big grasp out of your hand or anything like that. Everything was like in slow motion. And uh, I snapped on uh, one of my parachute hooks and I thought I had plenty of time to, to snap on the other one and uh, because I didn't want to break my leg when I landed. So I did that and I pulled the ripcord and I was about skyscraper high. So I wasn't really uh, aware of how, how far I had fallen, I knew it would take a couple minutes to reach the ground. And a couple minutes is a long time when you're trying to do something like that. And uh, uh, I suppose to some extent I was kind of groggy. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I landed in an open patch in uh, the suburb of Swinow in Nuremberg and uh, immediately was uh, captured by as may seem, an air raid warden and a sailor. And I almost landed on an anti aircraft battery which was located in this uh, open space. They asked me if I had a gun and I said no and they, so they took me over to a bench and took all my flag gear and uh, uh, clothing away from me except a pair of trousers and a pair of shoes. And they put a dry compress on my right arm which had been hit by flak and the flak was, piece of flak was still lodged in there. And uh, they put a dry compress on it. And I stayed there uh, for about four or five hours. This was on Sunday morning, about 11.30 in the morning, uh, uh, September the 10th, 1944. Eventually, a couple of Luftwaffe uh, soldiers came by on, on uh, bicycles. And they tried to get me to walk uh, over to a police barracks, and I couldn't walk. I think I broke. I think I broken my left ankle. Uh, they finally uh, got a truck to stop and to take me over there. And uh, I was in the police barracks uh, then for a while. And when I went in, I noticed my tail gunner, who was sitting in a in a room, and he was bandaged up, and his head had been bloodied, and I learned later that uh, he had uh, taken quite a beating when he came down. Probably, uh, in my own case, I had blood all over me, and uh, I think that maybe I might have saved my, my life. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the other thing that I credit uh, was saving my life was the fact that about two weeks before, I, before this happened, I listened to a per, uh, professional parachute jumper. Uh, tell how, how it feels when you jump and uh, where the pressures are and 
and how you just you fall and you don't know you're falling the earth moves up you don't move down and you can put out an arm and you just slowly roll over and or if you want to tumble you can pull your legs up and you'll just tumble or you can just lay out flat and you'll just fall flat and uh, there's a lot of things you can do with that and of course today with with, with the way these professional parachute jumpers uh, you know, do all the tricks that they're doing uh, it makes all that seem sort of mild but uh, it was quite an experience and uh, one of course changed the course of my life and was probably uh, part of uh, the greatest learning experience of my, my life uh, to have been a flyer shot down and being captured and being a POW. The, uh, one of the things that happened to me that I've always felt was rather amusing was when I got through the interrogation center, which was uh, a long way from being a picnic, um, I was in a first aid room and I woke up, I went in at night, at, at night, the night before, and the next morning I woke up and I looked up and uh, up on the wall was a shelf and had a couple cans on it. And one of them had uh, a can of big letters, K-L-I-M. And uh, uh, I recognized immediately that this was milk, spelled backwards. But the thing that really concerned me was I thought maybe my brain got scrambled a little bit and I was seeing things backwards now. But then I finally found that there were another can, there was another can there, and the, and the print was right. And so it, 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 at least it gave me a, a better feeling than when I first woke up. The, uh, uh, at the interrogation center, uh, uh, of course they give you a rough time and they really use any wounds that you have as a as a way of trying to get you to talk. In fact, the matter is, I didn't know anything that they didn't already know anyway. Uh, most of the people were flying on the missions that didn't have much information for them at all, even if they'd have told them everything they, they knew. But at any rate, I refused to talk. And I followed the name, rank, and serial number instructions we had been given. And uh, also with the knowledge that the people said that the people who had come back and had been able to escape and come back said that if you give them any information, they'll keep you forever. And the best thing to do is get them done and then get out. They'll send you out. But while I was there, I, uh, my arm began to be quite infected, and I was afraid I was going to lose my arm, possibly my life, if I didn't get some, some uh, medication or something to help me, take the flak out and get rid of the infection. So I really gave the guards a hard time and figured, uh, you know, if I didn't do that, uh, I was going to kill myself by just inaction. So I launched into some pretty stringent action and used to ha hammer on the door and curse at them and, and when they come over and and beat the door with their rifle butts, you know, I'd curse at them some more, and finally I got them to take me down to the first aid room, and, they, and a guy took a knife and a pair of tweezers and cut it, and he froze a little spot around the flak about as big as a quarter, and lifted out the flak. As a matter of fact, I have the piece of flak and brought it home with me. Uh, but at any rate, from there, from the, uh, that camp, then we went into the, from the trench camp we went after about a four or five day ride on a train, a miserable ride, I might add. Uh, we, were, we arrived at Barth, Germany, where Stalaglyph 1 is located. And uh, I was in the hospital barracks there for a, a while. It's really a first aid room, a first aid barracks. But then uh, I was in there for a few days and they put a cast on my arm. And, and they tried to get rid of the infection uh, to some extent, put the cast on my arm, put me out in the compound. And that's where I met uh, uh, all the roommates, and we stayed together for uh, the rest of the war. I walked in, uh, and I was uh, the last guy in to the room because these guys had all been over in another compound living in tents while they built this compound. And uh, they had a, an extra bunk there that hadn't been filled. And so they, I was assigned to that. And I walked in and uh, 
the fellow who was on the bottom bunk at Slocum uh, said, uh, and, the, and the upper bunk was empty. And that was going to be my bunk. He said, you're not going to be able to climb up there. He said, I'll take the upper bunk and uh, you can have the lower bunk, which is what happened. And Ed was a crusty guy uh, and uh, he, he, he was, was not the easiest guy in the world for people to get along with, but I've always remembered the kindness uh, that he expressed at that time. And uh, I might also add that, uh, that the, the guy that took me over there is, said, um, uh, each one of you get down in your mattress and pull out some Excelsior and give this poor cripple some Excelsior for his empty bag here because all I had was an empty burlap bag. And uh, there wasn't any rapid movement <coughs> among, the, among the roommates, but they eventually pulled, down, pulled out some straw and then each one of them gave me some Excelsior to put in my uh, mattress. And uh, they always called me Crip because this guy had referred to me as this miserable cripple. And uh, so I was known as Crip. Uh, during the time I was, was there. We were, of course, uh, then went through the normal procedure of, of being without food for about four or five months. And uh, we all lost a lot of weight. And fortunately, the war ended May the 1st for us when the Russians came in and liberated the camp. We stayed there for a couple of weeks. and. Uh, then were flown out to Reims, France, and were sent to a camp called Camp Lucky Strike. There were two other camps, one called Camp Chesterfield, one called Camp Old Gold, which is really a commentary on the change that's taken place over the years. And uh, uh, these camps were uh, holding places, the big tent cities, until we could come home. And then we shipped out and came home in, in June. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alpert. I might uh, just close by saying that um, this was probably the, uh, the greatest learning experience of my life. Uh, I don't regret it. I wouldn't want to do it again. Uh, but I learned a lot about uh, life in general and learned a lot about, uh, about myself. And uh, I, I think that Overall, the, the experience was uh, really a, a fantastic experience. And again, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but if, if you're able to go, th go through it and survive it, uh, then there are a lot of good things that can come from it. Children's carousel, the chestnut trees, the wishing well. I'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day in everything that's light and gay i'll always think of you that way i'll find you in the morning sun and when the night is new i'll be looking at the moon but i'll be seeing you